Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where uh, all we do for a half hour, 45 minutes is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the uh, senior editor, or not senior, I'm the uh, senior producer over here at Collider Video. And I am so glad you decided to join me on this Sunday for our, our little chat. For those of you who don't know, uh, like the title of the show says, you guys send in mailbag questions to us by sending them simply to the email address collidervideo at gmail.com. Once again, that's collidervideo at gmail.com. And then Monday through Friday, we pick out a couple for movie talk. And here on the weekends, all we do is just take a whole bunch of mailbag questions and kind of just talk movies for a little bit. So without any further ado, let's get into the first question of the day. And our first question today comes to us from Noel Davila, who writes, I've been a fan since the days of Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure Felipe appreciates that. Uh, my question is a two-parter. Have you noticed a parallel of the Daniel Fleetwood story to the plot of the movie Fanboy from 2009 about a terminally ill fan who gets to see Star Wars Episode I before it's released in theaters? Are there any other movies you can think of that predicted the future so accurately? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. Yeah, for, for those of you who don't know what Noel's talking about, um, of course, there, there was a story, we addressed this on Movie Talk the other day, um, there was a story about uh, Daniel Fleetwood. He was a terminally ill um, cancer patient who was not, they didn't think he was going to make it um, to December 17th, December 18th, when the new Star Wars came out. He's a lifelong Star Wars fan. And uh, an online petition started, and uh, everybody started with the hashtag trending like Force for Daniel or something along those lines. And what happened was Daniel got to see the movie. And then three days later, he passed away uh, in his sleep, having got to see the movie. And it was just an amazing thing. And I'm not going to go into the whole thing again, because I covered it on, on Movie Talk. Uh, but it was just, it's a beautiful story. It, it really is. Amidst the tragedy of the situation, it's a beautiful story. Now, for those of you who don't know, there was a movie out a number of years ago called Fanboys that kind of had that same kind of idea. At least it started off with that kind of an idea. And where a bunch of fans wanted to go see The Phantom Menace uh, so their terminally old friend could see it before. Now, that's how long ago it was. Um, and it was directed, actually, by a guy I know. I know uh, it was the director of the film was a guy by the name of uh, Kyle Newman. And I know Kyle. Uh, Kyle's actually been a, a guest on the earliest incarnations of Jedi Council before. He was also my special guest on our annual Masters of the Web panel this year at Comic-Con. Uh, and I got to see him again hanging out in the line at Force Friday at midnight at the Toys R Us. Um, and Kyle's a great guy, gifted director, all that kind of stuff. And so it was kind of a situation of life imitating art. But I, I don't know that I would call that situation a movie predicting the future. I mean, the idea of a you know a terminally ill uh, patient of any kind wanting to to see something or experience something before they died. I mean, that's kind of a common thing. And the fact that it kind of revolved around Star Wars, I'm sure was nothing new. So I don't know that Daniel's situation was an, a situation of the future being predicted by a fanboy so much as it was that just an example that good film imitates life and recognizes scenarios and the remarkable situations we find in life. So I, I, I don't know this is one of those things where I would call it movies predicting the future. And so I think there's a lot of movies. I mean, if we go down through the list, you could probably think of like 10 movies off the top of your head that reflected what is probably a real life situation that happens every day. And then something specific in the news stands out, but it's really something that probably happens all the time. And I think that was a situation with Daniel and just enough people got behind, behind Daniel, thankfully, to make sure he got his dream fulfilled. And I know it's happened for other people as well. So, uh, yeah. So I would highly encourage you guys, if, if you don't know much about Daniel's story, to go and read up about it. It'll uh, restore a little bit of your faith in humanity. Thanks a lot for the question. All right. The next topic today comes to us from a movie maniac who writes, Hello, Clyder crew. Let's play a game. If somehow you got into a situation where you were forced to pick one Disney-owned studio to never watch again, which one would it be? Your options are between Pixar, Lucasfilm, and Marvel. And also, stay awesome. Okay, so I mean, on yesterday's um, mailbag show, we played a little bit of games. Which was worse? 
which what were the three films? Green Lantern, the Star Wars prequels, or Mortal Kombat Annihilation. And I said there's actually some, while they're all bad movies, absolutely, I said there are some redeeming qualities about the Star Wars prequels, there's some redeeming qualities about the Green Lantern, there's no redeeming qualities about Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Not to be confused with the original, also terrible, but awesome Mortal Kombat movie. Um, And so I said that one's easy, it was Mortal Kombat Annihilation. This is on a whole nother level. This is on an entirely different level. I have to pick between Pixar films, Lucasfilm films, or Marvel films, one of those, and I can never see them again. All right, well, let's go through the list, shall we? Pixar, I have been saying, I've been curious to know what you guys would pick, so please jump in the comments section let me know what you would do. I've been saying for a lot of years that Pixar is not just, I mean, by miles, the best animation studio in the business. I've been saying for years that Pixar is the best movie studio in the business, period. Live action, animated, whatever. I mean, point to me another studio that seven years in a row put out the number one critically reviewed film of the year. Hasn't happened. Um, They just crank out gold. I mean, it's to the point that even when they put out a good movie, it's considered a big disappointment because, you know, what we expect from Pixar is just, foo, out of the mind. And then they, oh my God, I, I still think... I still think Inside Out is my favorite film of the year. It, it's tight be- right now. It's tight between Inside Out and The Martian for me. But that's anyway. That's just me. Um, Pixar. There is nothing like Pixar. Pixar is one of a kind. Nobody else comes close to making the movies that they do. And I just don't know how I would pick Pixar. Next is Lucasfilm. Well, that's just a non-starter for me. Be- Um, I live, breathe, uh, bleed Star Wars. I have my whole life. Um, so the, the notion, and not to mention we, who know, we may be getting more Indiana Jones movies in the future, all that kind of stuff. The concept to me of not being able to watch Lucasfilm movies anymore, i.e. Star Wars movies, it just, I don't drink. It makes me want to drink. Um, and dull the overwhelming sadness that I would feel. So for me, Lucasfilm is off the table. There's no way that out of the three I'm picking Lucasfilm. Let's just take that off the table right now. I just can't. It's impossible. There's no way. Then there's Marvel. Now, I am a massive Marvel fan. You know, I consider Avengers to be the best comic book movie of all time. Um, I absolutely love... Uh, you know, almost everything they've done. The first Thor movie, the first Captain America, the second Captain America, um, Ant-Man I thought was wonderful. Guardians of the Galaxy Megs is magnificent. You know, I just, I just love them. They're fantastic. They're great. Uh, I, I, just, I love Marvel films. I just, I, I die, I, I'm just incredibly excited for them whenever there's a new one coming out. I'm a huge Marvel fan. But, here's the but, all right? If I was forced to pick one that I could not watch again, Marvel films, Lucasfilm, or Pixar films, as much as it pains me to say it, I, and I had to, I mean, I I was being forced, I had to pick one, I think I would pick Marvel films to not watch again. I hate that, but here's my, my rationale behind that. There is, there is no Star Wars outside of Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm is Star Wars. Star Wars is life, breath, blood, everything. I, I cannot do without Lucasfilm. So that's that. Pixar, nobody else makes movies like Pixar. They just, they just don't exist. They created almost a genre in and of themselves. Um, to the point that when another studio puts out an animated film that's really awesome, we all go, what's the first thing we say? It's like it's a Pixar movie. I mean, that's, that's just how head and shoulders they are above everybody else. So there's nothing like Pixar films. Like if I don't have Pixar, I'm not getting other Pixar-like films. If I don't have Lucasfilm, I'm not getting Star Wars films. That being said, if I had to go without Marvel films, at least I still have DC movies that are cranking out comic book movies to kind of fill that gap. I am an unabashed lover of Man of Steel. I think that movie is awesome. I mean, it's all total respect to you. If you saw it and you didn't like it and it wasn't for you, that's fine. I Whatever. To me, it's a masterpiece. I, I appreciate that movie more and more every time I watch it. 
Um, I just think it's genius on a level that a lot of people miss. But anyway, that's just me. Um, and so while, you know, Green Lantern, you know, um, while that may be the case, you know, at least they've started a new cinematic universe and we got Batman versus Superman coming out, which aside from Star Wars, I can't think of a movie I'd be more excited for. And they're starting. So would they, was it going to be as good as Marvel? Will it be better than Marvel? Who knows? We'll have to see. But at least if I'm looking at those three things, Pixar, Lucasfilm, Marvel, at least there's something else out there that could possibly be a substitute, maybe better, maybe not quite as good, whatever, but at least something that could look like a substitute for one of those things, and that would be DC films could possibly fill in that gap that Marvel films would leave a hole, which would leave a hole in my heart if I had to give up Marvel films. So for me, if I had to, it's Marvel films. I am dying to know what you guys would pick. So if you had to choose one that you could never watch again, Pixar films, Lucasfilm, or Marvel, jump in the comment section, leave your thoughts, and give me your rationale. What's your thought process that goes into making that unbelievably unbearable decision? Thanks a lot for the question. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next question comes to us from Bobby, who writes, guys, is it just me or are we getting too many Star Wars teasers slash trailers slash TV spots? Am I the only Star Wars fan who wants to see no more scenes from the film? If anything, this worries me. Your views? Um, I got to tell you, man, um, so I try to do it without the glasses. I just, I just can't. My ears are getting buggy already. Um, I got to tell you, man, I actually completely agree with you. I totally agree. You know, it's funny because for a long time it was, why aren't there more Star Wars trailers yet? And now all of a sudden, a lot of Star Wars fans are like, oh, okay, you, sh you, you showed us enough. Enough's enough. Stop. Um, and really, they haven't given us a lot. Like, we've had three trailers. We've had three TV spots. To me, it's enough. All right? It's not... We haven't gotten into the Amazing Spider-Man 2 territory yet with, like, 18 trailers and 45 TV spots. So we haven't gotten to that territory yet. But I feel like, okay, you're, you've, you've done it. You've sold me. We're, I mean, I'm not a good test example because I was sold just at the mention of the word Star Wars. But look at the numbers. Record sales, t advanced ticket sales. This thing's going to smash all kinds of records. The marketing's worked. It's done. Keep showing the trailers that you've already put out. Keep showing the TV spots you've already put out. But I am with you, Bobby. I do not want to see anything else. I'm done. I'll, I'm, I want to watch the trailer again and again. And I, if I'm watching TV and the TV spots come on, I'm going to turn up the volume and watch the TV spots. But I don't want to see anything else new. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like they're going to ruin the movie if they show another one or two spots. Not at all. But I am with you. I am in that position right now where I'm like, I'm good. I actually could have done without that last TV spot. I mean, I, I'm good. I've seen all I want to see. I don't want to know anything else. You've And it's not like... You're underselling it. Like, obviously, the numbers, the ticket sales, the records being broken. Obviously, the marketing has worked. So the job's done. Don't overdo it. Now, then you get some guys like Christian Harloff. Um, and, you know, he and I talk about this. And he just, I understand it. Because there's a part of me is like this, too. He wants everything you can throw at him. He would sit down and watch an hour and 59 minutes of the two-hour movie if you let him right now. And that's totally cool. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just more like you, Bobby, where I'm like, okay, cool, enough's enough, I've seen everything I need to see, please don't show me anymore. So that's just me. I'd be curious to know, what about you guys? For those of you who are looking forward to Star Wars, or maybe you're somebody who wasn't looking forward to Star Wars and the marketing is selling you on it, do you feel like you need another trailer or two to convince you, or do you feel like that's enough? Jump in the comments section, let me know what you guys think. All right, let's move on to the fourth question today, and the fourth question today comes to us from Joel Ronsley, who writes, My question is regarding the role Robert Downey Jr. will play after Infinity War. There's speculation and rumors that he might be killed off or recast due to his age, which makes sense because he'll be almost the age where he can't physically play Iron Man, even though most of the Iron Man sees are heavily CGI, but he doesn't have to be Iron Man. What I think is that he should do is just be Tony Stark, and play a Barbara Gordon-esque role after she was paralyzed. Plus, the studio won't have to pay him nearly as much. I wanted to see your take on it. Well, thanks a lot for the question. Um, whether or not 
they're going to kill off Tony is a, a question that's yet to be seen. Marvel continuously surprises us. But then again, if they kill him off, uh, I, I doubt very much that he wouldn't then suddenly pop back up and reappear. Um, so I don't know if they're going to do that. But here's the thing. Robert Downey Jr. is not too old to play Iron Man. Why? Because he doesn't do any of the action stuff. I mean, whenever you see Robert Downey Jr., yes, there are physical Iron Man outfits, but I think I was watching a documentary recently, so even then they were just CGIing everything on top of him. I mean, it's not like Don Cheadle who actually had to move around in a 70-pound suit. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. doesn't do any of the action scenes. He's just Robert Downey Jr. He's just, basically, he's just Tony Stark and the CGI animators are Iron Man. So that being the case, like it's not like a Ben Affleck playing Batman thing. Like maybe once Ben Affleck hits 60, he can't physically do the Batman stuff anymore. But with Tony, uh, with Tony, with uh, Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man, that's not really something you need to worry about. As long as he can still just walk around and be Tony Stark, there's really no problem because everything else is CGI. Personally, if he wanted to, I actually think Robert Downey Jr. could be Iron Man for another 10 years. Maybe 12 years if he really wanted to be because there's not, he doesn't have to do physical action fighting scenes or anything like that. So I don't see the big deal. Now, one of the things you mentioned is, well, make it so he's not Iron Man, but he's still Tony Stark and he plays a Gordon S. Barber role. But the problem with that is Robert Downey Jr. is not taking a pay cut. Robert Downey Jr. isn't going to take a pay cut. If you want him back to play Iron Man, he's going to want his $50 million, his $60 million, whatever, whatever obscene amount of money that he's been asking for. And once again, I don't really blame the actors. I mean, if a studio is stupid enough to give you that kind of money, then take it. I would take it. You would take it. I don't blame Robert Downey Jr. for taking it. I did get a little pissed off at Robert Downey Jr. playing games with Marvel, saying, I'm not going to do it unless you pay me this much, but whatever. Um, and you guys know in recent movie talks and mailbags, I've talked about why movie going on he says should care about how much uh money they pay these actors considering you know you can't you have no right to complain about the price of movie tickets if you're also going to defend movie actors getting 20 million dollars for three months work getting 50 million dollars for you know walking on a stage I, it just you can't complain about it. anyway i won't go into all that again right now but suffice it to say you're not going to get Tony Stark. You're not going to get Robert Downey Jr. to come back and do another Marvel Cinematic Universe film as Tony Stark with any less of a paycheck. Just because you're not going to put the CGI armor on him, to him, he, he'll think, I'm still the draw, so pay up. So I don't see... If you're going to still use Robert Downey Jr., if you're going to pay Robert Downey Jr.'s salary, then you make him Iron Man. That just seems to make sense. It's like, let's... Pay LeBron James, use the sports analogy for a second. Let's pay LeBron James $25 million a year, but let's just have him play the last five minutes of games. No, no, no. You're paying him $25 million? You get out there and you play. Let's get our money's worth. And I think that's probably would be the same scenario. Now, then again, Marvel and Robert Downey Jr. might have already reached an agreement that Infinity War Part 1 is it. That they're going to kill off Robert. I doubt they're going to kill off Tony Stark, but... Maybe they recast him. Uh, I have a feeling they would recast Tony Stark before they would ever kill off the character because the character is just too profitable. Even if it's not Robert Downey Jr. playing it, the character is going to be profitable. So I don't see them uh, doing it that way. Just my opinion. Jump in the comments section and let me know yours. All right, let's move on to the next topic. And the next question today comes to us from Raimundo who writes... We often hear people saying that they want a live action version of a book, comic book, animated show, movie, etc. Why is that? Why do we crave seeing live action version? Do we see them as better or more adult? I don't understand why we all crave this. A good story is a good story regardless if it's live action or not. Love to get your thoughts on this. Well, well first of all, Raimundo, I, I do completely agree on the one point that a good story is a good story is a good story. That's part of the reason why for a lot of years I've been really pissed off. Not pissed off, but I, I kind of roll my eyes at the idea of a best animated feature category at the Oscars. The Oscars made that category as a cop-out. So they didn't have to deal with all the questions they were getting as Pixar movies were getting better and better. And, and year in, year out, being the number one critically rated films of the year, 
and not getting nominated for Best Picture, the Oscar was just looking for a cop-out as a way to, okay, let's give it its own category so we don't have to deal with these questions anymore. Um, because I've always said a good movie is a good movie is a good movie. A good story is a good story is a good story. And it doesn't matter if it's live action or animated or stop motion or claymation or whatever. Good movie is a good movie is a good movie. Now, that being said, you're asking a different question. You're asking why is our natural inclination to want to see it live action? Because, and I, and I agree with you, we do do that. And I think it's understandable that we do that because live action is the manifestation of what our imagination has come up with. Like, it's great we see the, the 80s cartoon shows of the Transformers and that 80s version, but we imagine what would that be like in real life? If that were in reality, what would it be? And we get to see it. And I, I got to tell you, you know, Lord of the Rings, having read all the Lord of the Rings books and watched the animated stuff when I was younger, going into Lord of the Rings and seeing the Shire, it, it just made me giddy because it was the physical manifestation of what my imagination had always dreamed about. And I think that's why we have our first inclination to want to see them live action. Now, that's different from saying live action is better. That's a different situation altogether. We're just saying that why do we have a natural desire to see our favorite books, our favorite cartoons, our favorite comic books, our favorite stories? Why do we have a, a desire, a built-in desire to see those in a live action big screen? I think it's because we yearn to see that physical manifestation. What would it really look like? That's the question in our heads. Once again, that doesn't mean that, that live action is better or worse or just as animated films or whatnot. Not at all. That's a separate issue. But I think it's really understandable that deep down a lot of us have the desire to see what would this look like in real life. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Ali Sutherland who writes, Hey Collider, love your show and watch it daily. Y'all are more entertaining than you can imagine. Well, thank you very much, Ali. My question is, if Suicide Squad does well next year, do you think Poison Ivy will be introduced in a sequel? In the New 52, everyone knows about Harley and Ivy's relationship. Do you think that since Harley is so hugely po uh, popular that she might get her own movie and Ivy will be introduced? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Ellie. And <clears throat> for those of you who don't know what she's talking about, there are incarnations of the comic book, New 52 and whatever, where actually like uh, Ivy and um, Harley Quinn have, have a relationship. They actually have a relationship together. Um, it, but there's two separate questions. Do I think there could be a Poison Ivy later is a totally separate question from will it be because we want to see Harley and Ivy together? I think those are two separate issues. I think we are going to see an Ivy at some point. And the, at least what it looks like is the nature, <clears throat> pardon me, what looks like is the nature of Suicide Squad. It looks like a Poison Ivy character would fit really well into that world. And I think that if Suicide Squad does well and they want to do more films, I do see Ivy fitting in well there. Maybe, but maybe it doesn't necessarily even need Suicide Squad. She could pop up in another movie, maybe a Batman standalone movie, maybe an Aquaman movie, maybe a Cyber. It, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of places she could fit in. Now, then that brings up the sec, but I don't think that would necessarily happen just because people want to see Ivy and Harley together. I have a feeling they want to explore Harley and Joker or what looks like might be a little bit of a love triangle with Harley and Will Smith. I mean, I, I don't know. So if they do bring her in, I don't think it'll be to explore that relationship between Ivy and Harley, although that is certainly a possibility, especially in today's movie going world. I mean, that is certainly a possibility. Uh, but I don't think if DC decided not to pursue an on-screen relationship between Ivy and Harley, I don't think that it all deters or lessens the chances of us getting Ivy on screen at all in the first place. Because I do think they, I would be surprised if they didn't already have some kind of plans for her. I think they do. And I think sooner or later, we're going to see Poison Ivy on screen. Just my thoughts. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Alyssa Kaiser, who writes, Hi, my name's Alyssa. This is my first time submitting a question to you. Well, thanks for writing, Alyssa. But do you think that Barry's father, ooh, a TV question, that Barry's father is Zoom, 
Or is it Barry because all the other Earth 2 characters have an opposite of themselves? Or I think the only theory for Barry's father being Zoom is because he gets out of jail and then just gets up and leaves. What do you think and why? Well, I had a theory for a while. We're talking about the TV show The Flash. I had a theory for a while that Zoom was actually Barry from Earth 2. But Zoom is just so physically bigger than Barry that I got a feeling that's not the case. And I thought I had some good reasons for thinking, like the Earth 2 doppelgangers like to seem to kill their Earth 1 doppelgangers, so whatever. Um, but then somebody sent me a picture of the guy who plays Barry, Barry's father, John Wesley Shipp. And I talked about this last week too, and we brought up that picture where if you look at the eyes on Zoom and then the eyes on Barry's, uh, John Wesley Shipp, they were, they're awfully similar. They are awfully similar. And so I am now in the camp where I once was in the camp that I thought Zoom was Barry from Earth 2, I am now in the camp that Barry's dad from Earth 2 is Zoom. That's the theory I'm subscribing to right now. And I think there's a lot of good reasons to believe that. But, you know, knowing these types of shows, they could throw us a complete curveball. They could throw us a total curveball at any time that kind of trounces both of my theories. But that's what I believe. I'm believing the same thing you are. Let's keep tuning in and see what how it's... So do me a favor. If you guys watch uh, The Flash, jump into the comments section. Let me know. Who do you think Zoom is? I'd, I'd be curious to hear any other theories. All right. Last question of the day and of the weekend. And this question comes to us from Joseph Hera, who writes, Hey, guys and gals. Personally, I can't stand when an actor or actress takes on a role in an action movie and turns around and won't support it and says, guns are bad. Uh, this has made me lose respect and appreciation for the few people in the movie industry. Is uh, Would love to hear what you folks think. Thanks, and may the force be with you all. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know of many situations like that. I can only think of one, uh, and that was the Jim Carrey situation a couple of years ago with... Um, uh, Kick-Ass 2, where Jim Carrey starred in the movie and then all of a sudden said, I'm not, he, he decided he, you know, he wasn't going to promote the film because he thinks he doesn't want to glorify guns and stuff like that. It's like, well, you were just, you took the paycheck and you were in the movie and now you're saying you don't want to promote the movie? I mean, that was weird. Now, I don't mind um, like an actor or an actress who is totally against guns, wants all guns banned, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I have no problem with those actors or actresses being in action movies. And because, you know, some people, I heard this stupid, stupid argument once where some there was an actor who was like really heavily against guns. And they were in uh, some kind of cop movie where there was some gun action. So oh, that guy's being a hypocrite because he's in a movie with guns. It's a movie. Do you think... Every actor they've ever cast to play Adolf Hitler actually wants to exterminate the Jews? No. No, that, no. He's an actor playing a role in a movie. Do you think, like, any bad thing, like, do you think that actors will only do things in um, fictitious roles? They're there to play a character who is not them. That means they're playing a character who will not do what they themselves would do. That's what acting is. So I reject as stupidity uh, any argument that I hear people say is, oh, that actor is against guns in real life. He, that turns me off because he's in movies where in the movie his characters carry a gun. It's a movie. It's a movie for heaven's sakes. One of my best friends... Um, is a hardcore pacifist. He's actually a uh, minister of like the largest church in Canada. Uh, super guy, total hardcore pacifist, believes in no violence whatsoever. Believes in absolute no violence. That being said, you know what his favorite movies are? Violent movies! Because as he once said, pacifist, I love being pacifist, but pacifist movies would be boring because it's a movie. It's make-believe. It's not real. So, I mean, these people who who just really have a political axe to grind. Look, everybody has a political axe to grind. I don't care if you're left-wing. I don't care if you're right-wing. Everybody tries to grind their political axe. But when people who, you know, somebody who's an NRA apologist and an NRA representative, if they're an actor, 
I have no problem with them going into a movie and playing a pacifist who's totally against guns. You know why? Because it's a movie. I have no problem with some actor out there who's very politically active about guns should be banned and yet going into a movie and playing a cop in a shootout. You know why? Because it's a movie. It's not real life. They're playing something that they're not. So I have no problem with that. But now that being said, this situation of like a Jim Carrey, and you said you don't like when actors, I don't know if there's been other situations like this. If there are, I haven't heard of them. Let me know in the comment section. But this situation of where Jim Carrey was, look, I'm a big Jim Carrey fan, good Canadian kid, all that kind of stuff. But I was turned off. Um, I was turned off by Jim Carrey when he took the paycheck, performed in the movie, knows it's just a movie, and then comes out and says, I'm not performing, I'm not promoting this movie because there's guns and violence and I'm against guns and violence. Like, you're, you're allowed to be against guns and violence and still promote a movie. The movie's called Kick-Ass, for heaven's sakes. It's make-believe. It's fantasy. Get your head out of your ass and go promote the movie. You took the check pretty fast. So while I am totally fine with people who are in gun and violence movies being completely against guns and violence off screen, I am, like you, very turned off by an actor... Like I said, the only situation I can think of is the Jim Carrey one who will perform in a movie and then come out and refuse to promote the movie. That did turn me off quite a bit. That's just my opinion. Love to hear what your guys think as well. Well, that'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of Collider Mailbag on this Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, just want to remind you, it is uh, the reason my face looks so stupid is that it is no shave November. Uh, I, so I do this so hopefully when you look at my face, it realizes, hey, that face looks stupid. Oh, that's right. It's Cancer Awareness Month. Maybe we should donate a little bit of money to cancer research. That's what the whole idea of uh, No Shave November is. I hope you guys will participate in that as well. Make sure you subscribe to our Collider Video YouTube channel right here. And uh, that'll do it for us, guys. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great weekend. And until next time, bye-bye.